Hey everybody, welcome back to Bob Key TV time once again for the broom wagon. Uh, a lot of ground to cover this week. No racing to speak of, but Phil Guyman with a very interesting uh, celebration of his recent retirement from professional cycling. Uh, Katusha team kit for kit of the week uh, up this time. And uh, of course the Muse Ed Musings and the tweet of the week. Always enjoyable. All of that coming up next on the broom wagon. All right, everybody, let's start with kit of the week, Katusha. Um, similar to last year, very sharp burgundy red on the shoulders and sleeves, highlighted with a little light blue stripe, uh, and then lighter red down the trunk, but Alpecin across the front of the jersey, new co-sponsor for the Katusha squad. I think they came across with the new signing for Katusha, current world time trialing champion, Tony, the Panzerwagen Martin, Tony Martin joining Katusha, bolstering their ranks. Uh, that would be a very powerful weapon for Alexander Kristoff if Tony Martin mixes it up in the sprints. Big goal for Tony Martin, of course, is getting the yellow jersey with the time trial in Dusseldorf to start next year's Tour de France in 2017. The tour will start in Dusseldorf and a uh, great opportunity for Tony Martin to swap the rainbows for the yellow uh, at uh, this upcoming Tour de France. So uh, he'll be on Katusha. Uh, and very similar to last year, like I said, very sharp kit, dark red, burgundy red shorts also with another little green, or uh, excuse me, light blue stripe. Um, and Alpecin, new co-sponsor. So. Uh, Tony Martin should have a good year on the Katusha squad. They're going to look very sharp. Um, I have to say, I still, I think I like Movistar's kit the most so far. Um, but Katusha, not too bad. And they've improved dramatically <laughs> over previous years, starting with 2016. And they're going to be looking sharp uh, for 2017. And uh, best of luck to everybody on Katusha. Uh, all right. Phil Guyman recently announcing his retirement. Uh, from professional cycling, and he had a very interesting uh, celebration. He went after the King of the Mountain Strava segments in Southern California. Um, a lot of them currently held by a rider who goes by the name Thorfinn Sasquatch. <laughs> uh, if you remember uh, a distant past Way back in March, I did a Bob Key TV about, um, about Thorfinn Sasquatch, uh, his actual name, Nick uh, Brant Sorensen, um, positive for doping uh, in the Masters National Road Racing Championships that he won in 2011, I believe. Uh, handed a two-year deal and then recently pled guilty to selling performance-enhancing drugs, including EPO. Uh, uh, on the internet. <laughs> um, so Thorfinn Sasquatch, uh, the holder of a number of some of the most iconic climb Stravas. If you're not familiar with Strava, Strava is a way to record and measure your time on, uh, on segments of climbs, popular climbs across the world. Uh, people on, on, on Strava, who belong to Strava, can go and give it a chance. Generally, I would imagine uh, they compare themselves <laughs> to their previous times in the hopes of improving. Um, but of course, at the top of the leaderboards for these segments, a lot of the most famous professionals, uh, and if you're on Strava and you're a pro racer, <laughs> you're very, very tough to beat. Just a quick example. Um, Mount Hollywood is a two and a half mile climb through Griffith Park. Uh, more than 6,000 Strava users have uh, ascended it. Uh, Thorfinn Sasquatch's time was 921 um, on that, and Phil Guyman just overtook him with a 905, so a flat out 10 minute effort. Uh, only 49 riders out of the 6,000 plus have been able to go quicker than the 11 minute mark. So Phil Guyman flying up that climb and I talked to him last night 
And he said he produced some of his best power numbers <laughs> on a lot of these climbs. And he tried to beat some of the times of Thor, Finn, Sasquatch, Nick, Brant Sorensen uh, in previous years. Looked at his watts, was astounded. He was just flabbergasted that he was slower. And he just thought to himself, this is not normal. This is not possible without some serious pharmaceutical help. So Phil Guyman, uh, setting to rights a lot of the most famous climbs in Southern California, uh, did a lengthy interview with cycling tips that I recommend that you read. Um, and it takes to task a couple of other pros, uh, uh, Levi Leipheimer <laughs> and Chris Horner. Um, so uh, an interesting way to celebrate your retirement. <laughs> Uh, when I retired from professional cycling, there was no <laughs> attacking King of the Mountains. I was so exhausted. <laughs> I was so completely annihilated when I quit bike racing that uh, there was no way I could do this. So congratulations to Phil Guyman for uh, a tremendous month of November, 30 days. And I think he, he set over 100 and 50 Strava KOMs, and that is uh, really, really impressive. Um, <clears throat> he had uh, one interesting thing to say about uh, Chris Horner. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, um, Chris Horner, as we all know, one of the most prolific American cyclists in the last, I'm talking 20, 25 years, and winner of the uh, Tour of Spain, Vuelta, Vuelta win a few years ago. So uh, let's see if I can find this. Mandeville, Latigo. I'm sure the riders in Southern California will know all about these climbs. Trash Truck Hill, Los Angeles Zoo, short but painful grade averaged 578 watts for two minutes and seven seconds so <laughs> that is freaking awesome like i don't think i could do that uh no not even for three pedal strokes that's 600 watts for two minutes that's impressive um so uh Top in the list of the trip down to San Diego County to try to take the KOM for Palomar Mountain, presently owned by Chris Horner. Uh, quote, Chris and I never got along. Uh, quote, I think he got away with some stuff. I think he was doing some stuff that wasn't completely upright. And last year he came back into continental racing with an attitude that was offensive and it was fun to beat him. Uh, it would be fun to beat him again. I checked Chris's uh, Twitter account to see if he had made any uh, comments about that. And uh, as of last night, I hadn't seen any. Uh, he might have done so today. But <laughs> uh, Wow. I guess when you retire, you can say whatever you want about uh, the riders without the sort of omerta that uh, uh, is a big part of professional cycling has been. Um, for going on a hundred years. Uh, so congratulations to Phil Guyman for uh, not just uh, breaking uh, and setting a number of Strava KOMs that were definitely <laughs> put up by uh, a rider that had tested positive and uh, uh, Thor Finn Sasquatch. And, but maybe more importantly, having the courage to come forward and say what you feel, say what you think, about one of your competitors, in this case, Chris Horner. So Phil Guyman, I hope your retirement is as thrilling as the last month of November has been. Maybe not as arduous. <laughs> I'll be on the couch recovering from even a two hour ride for the rest of my life, but uh, more power to you, Phil Guyman. And uh, if you're out there and you're doing Stravas, and you're using performance enhancing drugs, <laughs> maybe do this, maybe not use Strava 
and just use a stopwatch. Time yourself, write it down in your journal, <laughs> and keep it to yourself. Don't go on Strava. Don't have a pseudonym. <laughs> Don't be out there smashing Strava KOMs when you're using performance enhancing drugs. Just go ahead and do that. <laughs> Uh, if you can find a prescription, I guess, would be the other part of the equation. <laughs> so complicated, man. But uh, anyways, uh, Phil Guyman, big hero of mine now. <laughs> you have gone up to the top of the mountain as far as my estimation of ex-professionals and what, you, what they should do with, <laughs> with their free time. Uh, all right, everybody. <laughs> Next up, the Musette Musings. <laughs> First up in the Musette Musings, Chris Froome throwing shade on his former teammate Bradley Wiggins, the center of a controversy in Great Britain um, involving a medical package delivered to Team Sky from an official uh, in British cycling in 2011. So going a long ways back, uh, Chris Froome saying, I am completely in the dark on that. I have asked a question. Hopefully we will find out at the end of the investigation. Those are questions for Brad to answer about what happened back then in terms of who did what at the time. I still don't know all the answers myself. Uh, so Chris Froome in the dark <laughs> as well. Team Sky not talking. Um, I would imagine that Sir Dave Brailsford, uh, Sir Dave would be uh, uh, knowledgeable about what was in a medical package delivered to Bradley Wiggins before that, uh, but uh, we're going to have to follow this. There's an investigation going on right now in England um, to see what was in that medical package. That comes on the heels of um, a TUE controversy, uh, whereby hackers found out that Brad Bradley Wiggins had used uh, injectable steroids before the 2011-2012 Tour de France's and the 2013 Giro d'Italia. Um, and Chris Room went on to say this. People ask me, do I think it's tarnished his image? Uh, I think it certainly, I certainly think it's raised a few questions, that's for sure. A lot of people have said it's taken the shine off his performances back in 2012. Uh, so Chris Room referring to the TUEs that Bradley Wiggins was uh, applied for and granted by the UCI to use a very powerful injectable corticosteroid just before the 2012 Tour de France, which Bradley Wiggins went on to win. Um, Bradley Wiggins, in my opinion, found a loophole in the TUE program, exploited that to the maximum, uh, very powerful, um, drug to treat asthma and allergies is uh, Ben Bradley's excuse. Um, but I've said this many times before that the TUE program needs a total overhaul and that Brian Cookson, the president of the UCI currently, who was elected promising to make changes to the anti-doping movement um, across the board in cycling. Some changes have been made, but in my opinion, not nearly enough. And Bradley Wiggins will probably keep a hold of his yellow jersey from the 2012 Tour de France. But my question is, uh, what is the difference between Bradley Wiggins um, using a very powerful steroid that you inject into your muscles, I think, um, and, and go on to win the Tour? Uh, what is the difference between that and cheating with drugs? Uh, and using steroids without a TUE. If it's a legitimate medical use, um, okay, and maybe that's the issue here. Was the substance that Bradley Wiggins was approved to use by the UCI, uh, by the way, <laughs> back in 2012, was that the required essential protocol to treat his allergies and asthma, or did it help him win the Tour de France unfairly? That is the question. I think that he exploited a loophole to uh, help himself win. Um, and what I've recommended is that if you are granted a TUE uh, to treat an ailment, that you have to 
rest the protocol, medical protocol amount of time um, to get better, uh, not go on to win the Tour de France. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't easy cr for Chris Froome to be at the center of this um, through no fault of his own. And I'm sure he wants to distance himself from whatever might come of the medical supplies delivered to the 2011 Dauphiné to Bradley Wiggins. Um, and I have to commend Froome in this instance. Um, you know, it's not comfortable to talk about a former teammate, uh, I'm sure, and uh, what his, you know, what his uh, uh, medical uh, usage was at the time. So uh, the more riders that come forward and point out the flaws in the TUE system, the better. And uh, what we can be reassured that what we're looking at is an authentic display of natural talent, not the abilities of a pharmacist or your doctor. Uh, that's what is at heart here. And cycling, it's more important, in my opinion, than other sports to present an authentic spectacle. Uh, there's no differentiation between the stadium and the athletes uh, in cycling like there are in other sports. Bike riders are in the communities, on the climbs, on the rural roads, past the schools, post offices, supermarkets, uh, police stations, and it's, in, it's critically important that what people are seeing is real. And the coin of the realm is not necessarily hand-eye coordination, although there is an element of that. What makes a difference in bike races is your ability to suffer. And when you take that away pharmaceutically, then you ruin what people appreciate about the sport of cycling. Uh, so the more riders that are racing clean uh, that are upset at losing to riders they believe have exploited the TUE program, in my mind, that's the same as riders calling out other riders that are found to be positive for drugs. So if you're an athlete getting paid to race bicycles, and you know somebody is, uh, is uh, cheating um, through the TUE program, you have to uh, uh, be vocal about that, uh, like Chris Froome has done. Come forward, express your dis dismay, displeasure, <laughs> disgust, <laughs> all your disses <laughs> at riders that are cheating with the TUE program. Uh, and then a clear message will be sent to the UCI and Brian Cookson can fulfill his promise to clean up the sport of cycling and be on the forward, not on the receiving end, but on the tip of the spear in the anti-doping movement, way out in front of all of this stuff. So I've recommended more transparency uh, and if a rider applies, and is granted or applies and is denied, make that public knowledge. And you have to rest if you're granted a TUE. Um, so that's gonna continue to unfold, I'm sure. An investigation going on currently, like I said, into uh, British Cycling's relationship with Team Sky and what exactly was in that package way back in 2011. More doping news. Uh, this is the good news. <laughs> No positive tests at the, at the Vuelta. No positive doping tests. Um, they have thrown riders out of the race in the past. Uh, so that gives me hope that uh, the sport of cycling is cleaning itself up uh, and that what we see is actually real, is the rider's God-given talent uh, against the elements, against his competitors, with his determination and with his ability. And uh, so hats off to all the riders and some of the biggest stars in cycling competed at the Vuelta a España. Uh, and it's great news that none of them turned in a positive doping sample. No podium girls at the Tour Down Under uh, moving forward. Junior racers um, who presumably are aspiring to be professional athletes will do the presentation on the podiums uh, for the jerseys, the trophies, the flowers, the champagne. I don't know about the champagne. They might have to get an adult for that. I'm not sure what those laws are in Australia. Um, but uh, moving forward, the Tour Down Under, and I think this is a positive step for cycling to move into a more modern <laughs> presentation of our sport. Uh, the future stars 
on the podium with the current stars, the current winners of the races in the Tour Down Under. And my hope is that the Giro, Tour, and Vuelta will follow suit and all the other professional bike races, and we continue to move forward. Uh, bad news here for the riders of Skydive Dubai. Haven't been paid since April. <laughs> you know, bike racing is hard enough. Uh, hard enough as it is. And if you're not getting paid to do it, it is an absolute disaster. That's the worst case scenario. And um, it doesn't matter really how much you're getting paid. You're counting on that money. Um, even if it's uh, not that much, which Skydive Dubai, not one of the biggest you know, professional cycling teams out there. So, uh, but still, I was lucky enough in my career to get paid each month uh, from Team 7-Eleven and uh, I've always been greatly appreciative of that. And to have the doubt that you might not get paid and then April go by, May, June, July, and you're still racing, August, September, <laughs> until now with no pay, hopefully they'll get paid. One question I have about this is the money owed the riders is supposed to go into an account that the UCI holds and the UCI pays the salaries out of that account to the riders because this has been an all too common problem historically in bike racing is teams fold halfway through the year they don't get paid big promises are made for big salaries this happens time in time out again and again and again uh, in professional cycling has been a very, very tough part of the sport. Um, and sometimes it may be a better idea to sign a smaller contract for a team that you know will pay you. Um, it's, uh, it's tough being a bike racer. And if you don't get paid, it's absolutely horrible. Let's hope Skydive Dubai get paid eventually. Uh, and that's it for the Musette Musings. I'd like to get comments. Uh, please let me know what's the difference between Bradley Wiggins using injectable steroids to win the Tour de France and a rider that is cheating with drugs. I'd like your comments, your opinions on that, um, and uh, we'll go from there. Next up, tweet of the week. This week's tweet comes to us from Larry Warbass. Um, so what he says, I'm getting more French by the day. <laughs> Port de Nice, uh, in the immortal words of uh, Jean Siebert, um, famous actress from uh, a few years ago. <laughs> she moved to Nice because it was the only town in France where she could pronounce the name of it correctly. <laughs> Uh, nice baguette. Looks like lunch is going to be tasty for Larry Warbass. Um, but I'll tell you, one of the best things about being a professional cyclist is that most of the races uh, that you compete in, at least at the highest level, are in Europe. Gives you a chance to expand your horizons, uh, become a little bit more culturally aware of the world. Uh, and for me, I uh, always took maximum advantage of trying to uh, learn a little bit about the local culture, uh, some of the landmarks and monuments that we visited. And as a bike race, there is absolutely no better way. Uh, a little velvet underground in the, back, in the background. <laughs> Please forgive the background noise if you can hear that. Um, uh, one of the best things about being a cyclist is getting to know the country in the best possible way uh, on your bicycle. Not in the races, obviously, because you're concentrated on your surroundings right around you. <laughs> uh, but when you're out on training rides, uh, it's absolutely delightful on a nice day to be able to enjoy the countryside and uh, all the sights, smells, sounds, and tastes of the countries that you get to visit. So. Uh, Best of luck to Larry Warbass, this week's Tweet of the Week. Everybody comments, hope I get a lot. Um, thumbs up if you like these. You gotta keep the subscriptions coming or Bob TV will vanish. 
Uh, follow me on Facebook and Twitter. In the meantime, uh, if you'd like to subscribe, there's an icon that says Bobkey TV. If you just move your arrow there and click on it, it'll send you right straight to uh, the place to do that. And if you'd like to buy some t-shirts, holidays are coming up, but there's nothing better than a Bobkey TV. <laughs> Forget about all of those car company commercials where they they're trying to convince you that buying your significant other or somebody in your family or yourself a new car is the best TV, is the best Christmas present. No way. Bobby TV t-shirt's got to be up there somewhere. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>